You're ready for prime time, but how do you get the word out? Being a podcast guest and sharing your ideas and expertise can establish you as an industry thought leader. The PodConnect's guest marketplace is your introduction to podcast hosts sharing the good word in plant medicine and the world of wellness. Sign up at podconnects.com to have your profile sent to more than 60 of the top cannabis podcasters who are ready to speak with the leaders who are shaping the ever-changing cannabis industry. So, if you're ready to shine, go to podconnects.com today and join the guest marketplace. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And once more, let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for coming back. Maybe this is your first time. If it is, well, an especially warm welcome for you. Ahead of you, the next 30 or 40 minutes, I think we're going to be talking about cannabis. A whole bunch of things about cannabis. Now, remember, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. On episode 119, we've been talking about it for a while. Those escalating THC values driving up our tolerance levels, or perhaps just driving up how much THC we think is in that package. (laughs) There's a story uh, from a lab in BC that has questioned those THC values and suggesting that we need perhaps a standard for that testing. That's an interesting story. And another one we've been talking about for a little while is how we have managed to find some edible packages in Canadian legal cannabis stores that exceeded 10 milligrams per package. In fact, we had some over 100 milligrams per package, 10 pieces of 10 milligrams each. And we discussed before on the Cannabis Podcast how they're calling those extracts, which is how they're getting away with the higher THC. And we talked, about, I think, in the last episode about Health Canada having some concerns about that. Those concerns have grown. We have a story on that in this episode as well. And I had a note from Tony, one of my patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much, Tony. Great idea. He had an experience just the other day where he got too high. So he wanted to know, hey, Gary... What can I do when I get too high? Is there anything that can help me? I have a story that may offer you some advice, should that ever happen to you. Plus, we've been talking about terpenes almost since the beginning of the podcast, probably in, I think, episode six or seven, we started talking about it. Well, I have some new research that they just discovered. Well, I didn't just discover it. They just came up with this new research. A new term may come to your lexicon, and that is terpene cluster. They have found a grouping of certain terpenes that always seem to appear together. Very interesting story on that. And on Cultivar Corner, speaking of terpenes, we are doing one of those rare occurrences where I'm trying a pre-roll. And this time, it's Weed Me's Moon Rocket Sativa. Whoa, we're heading to the moon today. All of that and more on episode 119 of the Cannabis Podcast. And let me let you know that my inspiration for today's episode is Black Market's Jealousy, the strain of the year for Leafly last year. And I have a sneaking suspicion this is on an upcoming cultivar corner where you'll feel the full effects. So thanks to Black Market and Jealousy for the inspiration and the motivation for today's episode. Before we get too far, as usual, let me thank you for being a listener. And let me thank Jordana and Kevin for their support at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. Let me also thank Rob and Tony for their support on Patreon. Appreciate it. You'll find the links to both of those at the top right when you're sitting on the show page. Now, let's get to our first story. First story today is coming from StratCan.com, written by David Brown. Thanks for all of your efforts as well, David. And this is a story that we had been suspecting was going to happen for a while. The owner of one analytical testing lab is calling out what he says is a serious problem with the accuracy of THC levels on cannabis flower in Canada. Rob O'Brien, CEO and CSO of Super Research and Development in Kelowna, recently shared online his own independent testing results from 46 different cannabis products he purchased from BC Cannabis stores. The result of his test showed that what he says are significant variations in the cannabis flower he tested compared to what was stated on the label. In some cases, there was more than a 40% difference. In one example, results show a product labeled at 34% TAC to be only 19% with his own testing. And I have posted the link to the actual results on the show page so you can check them out for yourself too. Rather than publicly calling out producers or labs though, O'Brien says his biggest concern 
is holding federal and provincial regulators accountable. While he shared the results online, he didn't share the labs, producers, or product names. But he says he did share the entire unredacted info with the B.C. government and with Health Canada. I'm not here to try to shame companies. I'm here to try to solve this problem, says O'Brien. The credibility of the entire sector is in question if we don't get this right. Instead, he's placing that burden on those two levels of government. They're the ones that should be responsible for naming names if that does come up. Although he doesn't rule out labs or producers who may put their thumbs on the scale, O'Brien says he believes much of the discrepancies he found in his own testing were due to flaws in how producers are required to take samples for testing in the first place. One of the problems he explains is that the current federal regulations only require testing per harvest, even though there can be significant variation in the THC levels in the flowers from that harvest. Flowers closer to the light tend to have higher THC than those further from it, and while some growers take steps to mitigate this, variation of a biological product like cannabis is nearly inevitable. This, combined with the tendency for producers to then send in only the largest, most impressive flowers that have the highest THC, means that what is actually in the consumer's packaging won't necessarily match what the THC numbers show on the label. The largest buds are the ones that are closest to the label claim. That's likely the type of buds that are being sent to the labs for testing. These buds are 2 to 3 grams, maybe 4 at the extreme. And you can't put a 2 gram bud in a 1 gram bag. So the smaller package size have the smallest buds in them, typically 2 or 3, and those buds are 30 to 40% below the bigger ones. That's part of the problem. Another factor is the tested buds aren't going through a sometimes disruptive packaging process that can lower the THC levels. And when you send the first pristine buds to the lab for testing, then the others go through the process of being sorted and packaged, there's a lot of tumbling and bouncing around, and that knocks off trichomes that affect the THC level. So if you're testing the packaged product, you'll be much closer to what's there. If provincial buyers were held more accountable for the products they are generally the gatekeepers of in their provinces, he contends this would immediately force producers to begin better testing procedures on their own, regardless of the minimal requirement from Health Canada for batch lots covering an entire harvest. This is especially true since, as he points out, the most provincial buyers tend to have a bias against cannabis flour that is under 20% TAC. And a bit of a sidebar, you may not be aware of that, <laughs> but that is a common factor with the people buying for the provinces there seem to be the ones that are driving up the demand for these high THCs. End of sidebar. The provincial buyers need to throw away this thing that if they don't have 20% THC on the COA, that they're not going to buy their product. That's ridiculous, and it's contributing to the problem. THC content has significantly increased over the last two years. We need to have a better regulatory system, and we need to have better transparency. Hubert Marceau, a chemist and the director of development at Laboratoire Phytochemia, Incorporated, an analytical testing lab in Quebec, says consumers should take this kind of knowledge into account when buying cannabis. Even relatively fair and accurate testing results will always have some kind of variance, he says. Instead, he thinks consumers should think of the THC level on the label as a range, give or take a few points in either direction, not a specific number. This would account for at least some of the variance in flower size and batch size. You can never test the whole batch, so by testing a sample of that batch, you're only estimating the average. Consumers are need to be aware that they are askew. There's no other product in the market where you have this kind of false sense of security, this level of accuracy, down to two decimal points. Like O'Brien, he says he's also aware of stories that some labs will simply provide the testing results that a processor demands in order to keep their business. Eventually, it just becomes a numbers game, where people just want to have the higher number and will do everything in their power to have a higher number. And that's what's happening here. This also brings the credibility of the industry into question for Marceau. THC levels, from his perspective, seem to often hover just under 20% THC. So very high THC levels, sometimes well over 30%, raise his eyebrows. He references a study from 2021 that showed clustering of testing results from cannabis flour in two U.S. states that, once corrected for outliers from labs found to be inaccurate, showed most cannabis flour, when accurately tested, was around the 20% threshold, some a little under, some a little over. Eventually, the plant gets to a point where it can't produce more THC. There's no way in hell that THC that only resides in the trichomes that are on the surface of the flower is going to be 35% of the cannabis. Like O'Brien, he says he thinks a lot of it comes down to the 20% or, in some cases, even higher THC threshold some provinces prefer. This creates a situation where cultivars, processors, and labs are all encouraged to push up their levels to meet these demands. And this creates a situation where consumers are largely only able to buy these higher THC products. 
further cementing the idea of higher THC equaling higher quality. You have the consumer who's been told higher THC is better, which is the equivalent of saying only drink ever clear alcohol, so the distributor is saying it'll only buy lots over 20%. This forces the producer to put out more than 20% flour. And the part that's not discussed in this article is if those THC values are not accurate and the THC that's in our packaged product is lower or significantly lower than, than what we think it is, then our THC tolerance is not being driven up by these higher THC values because, in fact, the THC that's in those products is lower than that. So then people do not need higher and higher THCs. They're all getting off on that 20% THC, <laughs> which is the way things were back when legalization started. Some of our highest THCs back in that point were 20%, 22%. (laughs) So keep your eye on this story. There's going to be more developments on this one. I didn't dive into all the details of how big of discrepancy there was in some of those products with the THC values, but I do have the link on the show notes page so you can check it out for yourself. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And trust me, I have taken care of that cannabis infusion as I am required to do. That is my job after all, and I have done my job the way I'm supposed to. (laughs) This is the other big story of this episode, and this is one we've talked about before. Those escalating, speaking of escalating THC values, (laughs) from 10 in a package to 100 milligrams in a package. Talking edibles, of course. This story is from mjbizdaily.com, and it's written by Matt Lamers. Five Canadian cannabis producers face May deadline in extracts edibles conflict. Health Canada has asked five companies to stop distribution and sale of non-compliant cannabis edibles products by the end of May, and provincial wholesalers have been notified of the ongoing crackdown after months of confusion. Canada's cannabis industry and the federal government have been on a collision course over the product since January, when Health Canada started asking some licensed companies to stop selling certain ingestible marijuana products. Now, a bit of a sidebar here. It was Health Canada that originally gave them the approval. It was the provincial cannabis boards that allowed the sale of these products into the market. So my question is, how did it get past those levels before somebody said anything and started to wonder whether it should actually be that way? End of sidebar. The industry says the products are appropriately classified as cannabis extracts because the ingredients used are not food and thus are compliant with federal marijuana regulations. However, Health Canada, the nation's federal cannabis regulator, has said the affected products are improperly classified as extracts and should actually be categorized as edibles. The distinction is important because any cannabis product classified as an extract has 100 times more allowable THC per package than a product classified as an edible. For instance, certain packages of Ottawa, Ontario-based Indiva Limited's Wild Cherry Lozenges and Life Lemon Lozenges contain 100 milligrams, 250 milligrams and 500 milligrams of THC per package. However, if those were classified as edibles, they would be limited to no more than 10 milligrams of THC per package. Indivo was one of the five companies hit with a notice of non-compliance letter by the federal regulator. Toronto headquartered Organigram Holdings also said it received a notification from Health Canada, claiming some of its products were incorrectly classified as extract rather than edible. Both Indiva and Organigram paused production of the affected product formats. Health Canada released a long-awaited compliance statement in early March intended to help identify products improperly classified as extracts. Health Canada said federal license holders with non-compliant products are expected to stop further distribution and sale of those products in question by May 31st. To date, five non-compliance letters have been issued regarding affected product formats, but that number might grow while Health Canada gather information from more on their products. That's what consequences license holders could face if they fail to comply. The spokesperson said Health Canada's preference is for regulated parties to voluntarily undertake actions to regain compliance. However, Health Canada may take enforcement measures to address noncompliance or mitigate risk to public health or public safety, as outlined in the Compliance and Enforcement Policy of the Cannabis Act. Those measures could range from calls and letters, which are intended to educate and prevent noncompliance, to inspections, to measures intended to correct noncompliance or address a public health or safety risk. These could include the suspension or cancellation of a federal license or the issuance of administrative monetary penalties up to $1 million. Health Canada also informed provincial wholesalers of the situation. The Ontario Cannabis Store, the largest marijuana wholesaler in Canada, subsequently sent letters to suppliers on March 15. 
In one such letter, viewed by MJ Biz Daily, the whole state reminds the recipients they must ensure products they sell to the OCS are compliant with applicable laws and regulations. If you currently sell or have proposed to sell products to the OCS that may be affected by the compliance statement, you must provide the names and brands of the affected products by the end of day, March 24, the letter reads. Industry sources say the crackdown will cost the struggling industry tens of millions of dollars. They also say Health Canada's crackdown is a gift for the underground market since legal cannabis edibles containing no more than 10 milligrams of THC per package can't compete with illegal products that don't face such restrictions. And a bit of a sidebar, I totally agree. This action by Health Canada is just making the black market even, even stronger. Or shall I call it the legacy market rather than the black market? I know some people are offended by those terms. Another source of frustration is the fact that the products Health Canada is trying to pull from the market already underwent the government's so-called Notice of New Cannabis Product Process, which requires licensed producers to notify the regulator months in advance of new products. And a sidebar again, that goes back to my first point. (laughs) They let all these through, so, so why did it take this long to realize that they might have made an error? End of sidebar. Shane Morris, founder of Ottawa based Morris & Associates Consulting, said serious questions need to be asked about why Health Canada reviews several NNCPs for these products and then allowed them to exist in the market for years. For example, the Organogram Jolts were launched in August 2021 and subsequently had multi-million dollar sales. How does this happen? Morris asked. Regulatory certainty is a key element of good regulatory policy. Having the regulator change their minds overnight after months or years of allowing reviewed products in market speaks to their incompetence and or gross inconsistency on the part of Health Canada. Morris wants the industry to ask for an independent review of the situation. And what do you think about that? I mean, these products have been in the market for a while. They were originally approved by Health Canada with these higher TET levels. And then I guess somebody in one office must have opened up their package and said, Whoa, I think we might have made a mistake. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cult of Our Corner today, we're talking about a company that, I'm not really sure why, <laughs> hasn't come up before. On Cult of Our Corner, I guess part of the reason is They do a heck of a lot of pre-rolls, and as you know, if you've listened to any of the cannabis podcast, I'm not a big fan of the pre-rolls for the the cost and the the benefit, but I decided to take a difference. I had some family coming over for a visit on the weekend and decided to go to another store and see if they could find me nice something nice and sweet to kind of celebrate with. Now, I wasn't very specific in my request. (laughs) I was looking for something infused. I did not specifically state that I wanted something on the indica side of things. So (laughs) when my brother and sister-in-law were over last night, I pulled this out ready to share it. And then I realized that it was a sativa and we were heavily into the night. And that would likely mean that most of us would be up the rest of the night (laughs) with those sativa strains. (laughs) So I stopped it and decided that I would do it as a cultivar corner and see what we got. So what are we talking about here? We're talking weed me. Weed me just has a ton of pre-rolls. A bunch of dried flour as well. They have a really expansive product line. Let me give you a sense of who Weed Me is and what they do. So the who they are? Over a decade ago, friends and founders Terry Kulaga and Benny Pressman bonded over their passion for cannabis and the idea to provide Canadians with a high-quality product. We believe in the power of this unique, beautiful plant and its ability to improve people's lives. In 2016, Terry and Benny set out to become pioneers during a time when the cannabis industry was still up and coming. Their passion, excitement, and adventurous mindset led them on a journey to provide people with high-quality cannabis. Leveraging their livelihoods and taking a leap of faith, Weed Me was founded. If you're willing to go all in, you have that chance to come out on the other side as a winner. At the end of the day, it's all about inspiring people. The amazing team at Weed Me is passionate and enthusiastic about the products they produce. They understand what it takes to grow, package, and market superior products and get it into the hands of Canadians. Inspired by high standards in producing quality cannabis and the accessibility they provide to consumers, each employee makes a difference. From day one, Weed Me has been committed to quality cannabis. Our passion and excitement continues to grow as we move forward in breaking barriers and developing new products. We want to bring you the best products at accessible prices conveniently for you. And we hope you enjoy our awesome weed. That's who they are. Now, what they do? Let's give you a bit of a rundown on that and then we'll talk about the cultivar we're talking about today. 
At WeedMe, they ensure quality through every step of the process. From cultivation to packaging, quality is never overlooked. Their 20,000-square-foot state-of-the-art tiered grow facility, centrally located and controlled and monitored 24 by 7. They operate a fully automated system that monitors the grow room, responding to the needs of the plants throughout the different stages of the growth. LED lighting is used to grow the plants for the reduced environment impact to remain energy efficient while still achieving highly effective growing results. Rock wool cubes are used as a grow medium for the increased ability to specifically control the fertigation, offering a product of the difference many have noticed from the first smoke. We believe that drying is more of an art than a science. All of our products are carefully removed from the drying room after they have been approved as ready by our experienced and passionate cultivators. Our small indoor-grown batches are machine-trimmed and hand-polished in medical-grade-like clean rooms. The air is changed every two hours, ensuring a faster drying process without any loss in the quality of the product. Their unique genetic library of over 150 strains is carefully selected from the best European and Canadian cannabis genetic freezers. They treat their buds with love and care, properly flushed, hang-dried in the most optimal environment, cured, and carefully trimmed. And that brings us to today's Cultivar Corner, Weed Me Moon Rocket Infused Pre-Rolls, the Sativa version. Mm. And I popped the tube on that in the standard plastic dube tube, is how they're distributing them. And Weed Me just has a ton of different cultivars that they are keep pushing out. This is a very popular one. Mm. So what is this? This is their Weed Me Moon Rocket, which is... A strong THC potent one gram pre roll made with premium sativa flower painted in distillate and rolled in keef. And that's the first thing you notice when you pull out the joint is definitely rolled in keef. Just has a really interesting texture on the outside of that. You can see the keef just hanging on. Uh, some Arabic gum, I think, is what they're using to hold that in place. Oh, delightful smell. Definitely lots on the on the limonene side. Now, are they giving me any terpenes? I can't find any terpenes on, on the web, on the packaging, which I guess is one thing that I will hold against them. Because, I mean, really, if you're doing that much cannabis, you should know that terpenes are a pretty big, <laughs> important part of what we're doing. And I can't find terpenes on the web. Can't find them on the package at all. So we're just going to have to do this one without realizing what the terpenes are. Now... There is a bit of disappointment in my head this morning, <laughs> and that's because of the differing values that we see on the internet and what the actual product has. So on the Weed Me page, which you of course can see a link back at the show page for Cannabis Podcast, I have Moon Rocket Sativa, and they are stating that the THC range on this is going to range between 38 and 45%. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> And then why do I feel ripped off when I look at my THC and it is only 35.56%? <laughs> now, I shouldn't be disappointed in a 35% THC rating on a pre-roll, but when you tell me that it's supposed to be 38 or higher, I'm going to feel a little ripped off at 35.5. <laughs> so I feel a little ripped off. Let's put the numbers aside and because I can't be doing any of this in a crafty, this is going to be entirely the pre-roll. And you have to be a little cautious when you're handling it so you don't drop too much of that keef off of there. And let's see what happens when we apply some flame to the Moon Rocket Sativa pre-roll infused with distillate and dipped in keef. And this from the folks at Weed Me. Let's see how easily it fires up. Mm, nice, nice smooth start. I'm always worried with these infused pre-rolls and having that distillate in there. There's no indication on the package here whether this distillate is using natural terpenes or botanical terpenes. I'm going to suggest that they are just natural terpenes because there are no botanical terpenes listed on the, on the label. So let's hope that is the case. And there is a bit of harshness as I pull that in. Now, is that the distillate? If I cut back and I take a little bit of a lesser of a hit, it's not as harsh on the throat. Because as you know, one of the things I don't like appearing on Cultivar Corner is the sound of me coughing. 
<laughs> and coughing my lungs out. So I think on the Weed Me Rocket Sativa, got to be a little bit cautious in how big and heavy a hit you pull in. Because when I did that the second or third time through, uh, I had to hang on a little bit because I really wanted to start coughing. But so far, when I take it a little easier, mm, and that's the key. It's inhaling enough to have some effect, but not so much that your lungs are now bursting <laughs> and you feel you have no choice but to let that all out. Now, despite that I do not have the 38 to 45% THC as was promised, <laughs> my 35.55% THC is fairly quickly taking over my endocannabinoid system. This was what I was looking for when I went to pick up one of these infused pre-rolls. I just wanted a bit of an extra kick, you know, because we've already talked about the varying THC levels and how we don't always necessarily have to go for those high THCs. But I thought in this case, I really wanted to try that. Oh yeah, there's the happy eyes. Oh, coming in fairly heavy too. Oh, that beautiful sense of euphoria. Mm. Oh, I'm liking the taste of this. Now we could have a debate until the end of time over the benefits of the pre-rolls in terms of the cost to buy one of those pre-rolls as opposed to generating one yourself. And this, I think, was about 18 bucks. I can't believe I even said those words. <laughs> $18 for a pre-roll. And as you are probably aware, if you would ask me that outside of the context of the podcast, I'd say, what are you spending $18 on a pre-roll for? Why don't you roll it yourself? Having said that, yeah, okay, this is really coming on really strong. And in one of those rare occurrences, I think I'm actually going to put out the joint. <laughs> I think I have achieved nirvana. Oh, yeah, very nice. And as I say, once you get over that initial piece of not trying to take too big of a hit, I turned it much smoother. I haven't really felt a need to cough since all of that started but yeah <laughs> I'm liking it I'm probably about a third of the way through that joint and I don't think this has ever happened before on Cultivar Corner actually I'm pretty sure this has never happened before on Cultivar Corner <laughs> I'm going to roll off the nice white ash Once I do that, I'm going to take one final hit. And I am saving the rest for later. Oh, that's impressive. <laughs> if you can get me to this stage after just a little over a third, between a third and a half of that joint has been smoked, you can still hear a little tension in my voice. Because obviously there is some smoke in there. I'm not finding it really harsh. But I guess it's an early morning situation. My throat's not quite ready for it yet. Weed me. Moon rocket. Sativa. Not quite what the THC promised was at 38 to 45%. What the package actually says is 35.56% THC and actually about 0.7% of CBD. But <laughs> if you're looking for a pre-roll that has some elevated levels of THC, that has a fairly quick impact, takes you to a fairly decent high in relatively short terms, this may be what you're looking for. 
the Weed Me Moon Rocket Sativa. I think I'm off to the moon. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Next story, we are going to canterp.ca for a groundbreaking new research on terpenes. It was published this year to better understand the current chemical diversity in cannabis. Researchers tested around 90,000 cannabis flower samples destined for sale across six legalized U.S. states to discover their cannabinoid and terpene content. No study has ever conducted cannabis testing of this scale, making this research the most significant cannabis analysis ever done. After analyzing the 89,923 cannabis samples, new information was uncovered that could influence our approach to studying cannabis aroma and terpene therapy. The research revealed some unexpected results on the phytochemical content of cannabis regarding terpene diversity, percentages, and commonly reoccurring aromas. However, the most exciting development for the cannabis industry was the discovery of new clusters of commonly co-occurring terpenes. These clusters could potentially replace the current commercial designations of sativa, indica, and hybrid. For all of us terpene enthusiasts, the research's most valuable information was the comprehensive terpene composition data set. The study listed the 14 most commonly encountered terpenes in commercial cannabis across the United States. This information is essential to cannabis sommeliers, as these terpenes could be considered the primary terpene in retail cannabis flower. Considering cannabis contains over 200 terpenes, this research clearly narrows the potential list of terpenes for cannabis aroma connoisseurs to become familiar with. Myrcene, beta-caryophylline, and limonene were the most abundant dominant terpenes. The secondary terpenes were humulene, beta-pinene, linalool, and alpha-pinene. Bisabolo, camphene, terpinaline, osamine, alpha-terpenine, gamma-terpenine, and neurolidol were present in smaller amounts. According to the study, the overall terpene content in cannabis averaged 2% by weight of the flower samples. Interestingly, individual terpenes were rarely present at more than 0.5% and most testing at 0.2%. These numbers are surprisingly low considering new trends in the cannabis marketplace for high terpene products. The low terpene content could indicate the cannabis industry's previous focus on developing and marketing high THC strains over rich terpene profiles. Due to the industry's focus on breeding high THC cannabis, it's not surprising that THC-dominant cannabis flowers displayed a higher terpene diversity compared to CBD-dominant or balanced strains. The lack of terpene diversity in CBD strains is a significant gap in the cannabis market. CBD makes up a large portion of cannabis consumer products, and this lack of diversity limits the variety of options for consumers. Low terpene percentages and lack of diversity are not good news for terpene-seeking CBD or THC flower consumers. However, if terpenes are your thing, some excellent options are available in Canada to boost the terpenes in your cannabis flower. Products like Bud Boosters are a unique and straightforward solution to increase the terpene content of your stash. Through testing almost 90,000 cannabis flower samples, the research study confirmed that indica, sativa, and hybrid labels have a poor relationship to the underlying chemistry of retail cannabis, something we've all been saying for a long while as a bit of a sidebar. These designations inherited from the illicit black market do not hold up to modern testing. The study found that these terms are entirely arbitrary and not based on the cannabinoid percentages or the terpene content. Overall, it appears these commonly used commercial categories and labels are not reliable indicators to differentiate effects for cannabis consumers. This breakthrough paper's most exciting reveal was the discovery of distinct terpene clusters. Never before seen in cannabis research, the terpenes of all 89,000-plus samples were plotted on a graph to look for co-occurrences between terpenes. Using an analysis tool called K-means clustering, the researchers found three different pairs of commonly reoccurring terpenes. Cluster 1, caryophylline and limonene. Cluster 2, myrcene and pinene. Cluster 3, terpinaline and myrcene. There was also a trend in cluster 3 associated with modestly higher levels of the cannabinoid CBG. The clusters are determined based on high levels of specific primary terpenes across all the samples. What this means for the cannabis world is that we may have discovered a new way of categorizing cannabis strains based on chemical content, and it's not cannabinoids, it's terpenes. The research on terpene clusters is in its early stages. Still, these emerging clusters can likely separate most strains into one of the three categories. Further investigation needs to be conducted, but this is an exciting new direction for the industry and cannabis consumers. 
As we know, terpenes are scent molecules. This study further advances the theory that it's all in the aromas. Practitioners of aromatherapy have considered terpenes therapeutic for centuries. Research into this alternative therapy continues to support the cannabis industry's approach to using terpenes to identify stimulating or sedative cannabis strains. According to the massive data set, the widely used indica, sativa, and hybrid labels are inaccurate representations of cannabis phytochemicals, making them poor indicators of the overall cannabis experience. The subtle effects of terpenes in cannabis affect the stimulating or sedative experience. Current labeling does not provide enough information to determine these effects. For consumers to understand the effects of any cannabis strain, brands should consider labeling their products with their primary terpenes. This would be a more accurate representation of the product as this research shows that terpene composition most effectively distinguishes differences when categorizing cannabis products for consumers. As the cannabis industry continues to learn about the active compounds of cannabis, all commercial labels should include primary terpenes and cannabinoid content to guide consumer purchases. As consumers, we need to find our preferred terpenes and select cannabis strains based on these preferences. Understanding terpene profiles is essential to finding the right products for you. And that story from canterp.ca. Terpene clusters. That's the next best thing. Mark my words. <laughs> Just like we, uh, when we started out with legalized cannabis, we didn't see any terpene information on our labels. I suggest that within two to three years, not only are we going to have the terpene percentages, but we will now start referencing those terpene clusters as a way for you to identify the type of cannabis you want. This industry just keeps growing and keeps being fascinating. Helping you discover your terpene profile, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Let me thank Tony, who is a patron on Patreon of the Cannabis Podcast. And he had a great idea. Sent me a note just a little while ago, said, you know what? I was way too high last night. What can I do? Well, here's a couple suggestions for you. This is from Area52.com. What to do if you're too high? The ultimate guide to sober up from cannabis. Just a few puffs or maybe one little bite more, you said. Before you know it, you find yourself curled up on the couch dealing with one of the strongest highs you've ever had. Some people can tolerate that experience, but if you're one of those who can't, then this is for you. We've listed some of the best tips for sobering up and how to make things more comfortable. Cannabis has many cannabinoids, like CBD and THC. These bind of the CB1 and CB2 receptors in the endocannabinoid system, which modulates many physiological functions. These include pain, emotions, moods, sleep, appetite, memory, learning, focus, concentration, motor and sensory functions, fear, anxiety, stress, and more. THC binds strongly to CB1 and can overstimulate it, making you feel more anxious, stressed out, and paranoid. If you find yourself in this situation, here are some things you can do to reverse it, or at least make it more manageable. 1. Don't panic. The more you concentrate on these negative feelings, the more you'll be feeding into them and worsening your experience, so please, don't panic. If you're afraid of overdosing and it's contributing to your panic attack, then know that you won't overdose on cannabis. There aren't enough cannabinoid receptors in the brain center that controls our breathing and heartbeat. High THC doses won't affect your breathing capabilities. 2. Relax, rest, or sleep. Have you ever wondered why you developed a couch lock or felt so sleepy and deeply relaxed after consuming THC? It's because of the CB1 receptor as well. It promotes sleep and relaxes the muscles. This effect may also occur because of myrcene, a terpene known for its sedating and relaxing effects. If the couch lock is becoming too unpleasant for you, just... Relax, give in to the sensation, and rest. Better yet, sleep it off. When you wake up, the effects will have worn off. 3. Shift your focus. Shifting your focus also helps get your mind out of your unpleasant high. You can take a quick walk around your backyard, do some light household chores, or maybe even watch a movie. You should not do activities that require quick thinking, judgment, and reflexes like driving, since marijuana impairs these functions. 4. Use CBD. Using CBD also helps dampen some of THC's mind-altering effects. CBD doesn't bind well to the CB1 receptor, so it won't get you high. However, CBD can dock on another area in the receptor, not its active site, and change its form or shape. This makes it harder for more THC to bind to the receptor and cause their overstimulation. 
CBD also dampens the effects of THC on the brain's reward and pleasure centers. It also eases the psychotic symptoms induced by high THC levels. You can place a few CBD drops under your tongue or vape CBD oil. These methods produce fast effects, and you could feel a bit better in just under 15 minutes. Try aromatherapy as number five, or use terpenes if you have them on hand. Many have calming effects when inhaled, but you could try eating foods high in them too. Limonene. Abundant in lemons produces an anti-stress effect that can help calm your mind. You can also try plain lemons. Just squeeze a couple of lemons into a glass of water and drink. You can also cut a lemon in half and suck on its juices. Not only is it refreshing, but it might help you relax and leave you with a very sour taste in your mouth. <laughs> Caryophylline. Caryophylline is a popular terpene known for its relaxing effects. Black pepper is high in caryophylline, so you can also try munching on black pepper. As a sidebar, we were just talking about this the other day. <laughs> and I don't know how high I would have to be to munch on black pepper kernels. <laughs> But it is offered, and it's offered by many different solutions as a way to knock down some of your THC. Just pop a few kernels in your mouth and chew. It probably takes some getting used to, but it might relieve some of the uglier side effects of THC. Rosemary, oregano, and cloves also have caryophylline, so get creative in the kitchen or be brave and munch on them plain. Pinene. Ever walked through the woods and felt immediately relaxed? There's reason for that. Pinene can impact your mood, so take a walk if you have woods nearby. Not by yourself, please. Otherwise, find some pine needles or use pinene to take a fake breath of fresh air. Hint, it'll take more than one breath. Just remember, essential oils and terpenes are potent and can be dangerous. Be careful when using them, especially for inhalation or ingestion. And six, keep yourself hydrated. Common side effects of THC also include dry mouth and dry eyes. According to research, it decreases the production of saliva and tears. These unpleasant sensations can be pretty uncomfortable and contribute to your worsening anxiety and stress. To relieve these sensations, you should keep yourself hydrated and drink plenty of water. Avoid alcoholic drinks since weed and alcohol don't mix well together. In fact, alcohol can increase the THC levels in your blood. 7. Grab a light snack. Eating light snacks address three things. It takes your mind off your high, it prevents edibles from hitting you too hard, and it satisfies your craving for food. There are no significant differences between smoking weed on an empty stomach and smoking weed on a full stomach. However, the effects of cannabis will hit you hard and fast if you consume edibles on an empty stomach. Experts believe that an empty stomach absorbs cannabis more quickly, so its effects can come on strong and hard. High THC levels can also induce munchies when it activates the CB1 receptor. This doesn't cause any discomfort, but what you eat might. So instead of snacking on fatty and salty food, stock up on healthy fruit and vegetables for when the munchies hit. And eight, alert a friend. These methods only help relieve THC side effects, but how long its potential effects last depend on your metabolism and how much THC you've had. If the effects are worse, then alert a friend. Sometimes having a sober person around can ease your mind, but they're also available if you need further help. And then the bottom of the article covers some areas of how do you get too high. Well, you should have figured that out on your own. <laughs> that is a pretty good article from Area 52 on you got a little too high. What can you do to take some of that high away? Once more, let me thank you for being a listener of the Cannabis Podcast. I truly appreciate you being here. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, you can send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. If you feel so inclined and you like what you hear, you can buy me a doobie or you can become a patron of the podcast on Patreon. You'll find the links at the very top right on the show page or at cannabispodcast.com. Thank you so much for being here. That's it for episode 119 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley... This was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hey guys, Montal here, inviting you to check out my podcast, Let's Be Blunt with Montal. 
where we have candid conversations about everything cannabis. We have over 250 episodes in our library, and a new show drops every single Thursday. So be sure to subscribe, and if you like what you hear, make sure you leave us a review. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh.